What if we could learn from outstanding leaders in business, sports, and education from some of the best voices in corporate America? Lighting the Path is a series of interviews with industry leaders whose stories highlight strategies that build purpose-driven cultures, engage and retain top talent, develop drivers that create high-performance teams, and connect people to the vision of your company. Join us to hear from game-changing, talented leaders whose paths make a difference at work and at home. I'm blessed in my journey to meet a lot of leaders, literally globally. And uh, I, I, I find leaders run into the different uh, drivers in, their, in the way that they approach uh, their teams. They're very tactical, driven, results-based. Uh, and then others that are very heart-led. And I'm so excited about our, our conversation today because we get a chance to visit with, with Joyce Russell, uh, who is... Uh, just an amazing, amazing force of nature. I had a chance to meet her at the uh, ASA Executive Vision uh, Forum that was held. And uh, listening to her journey, it was important for us to craft some time together. She's currently serving as the, uh, the, uh, the president of the U.S. Foundation for ADECO's U.S. Foundation. Uh, where she ended up today was that she started working at a desk and then grew to a point where she was actually president of their, their U.S. staffing operations and grew it from a few hundred million to $2.3 billion. So she's got a track record of very much results. But the way she got that was through the, the, the word engagement. We're going to be spending some time on today because this leader is an engagement leader. So Joyce, welcome. It's been, uh, I've really been looking forward to today. Mike, thank you so much for having me. We met at Executivision when you were on the panel for employee engagement and just knocked your message just so resonated with me. And so it's great to be back in the conversation with you. And I did start on a light industrial desk, right, as a recruiter. And it was so great to start there and end up running uh, one of the biggest P&Ls in the world for the ADECO group, the ADECO Staffing P&L where we put close to 100,000 people to work a day. And uh, now my journey goes from that role into leading the ADECO Group U.S. Foundation, which has three pillars in the foundation, which is upskilling and reskilling American workers. And you and I know that the future of work doesn't work for everyone. So it's get great to give the gift of learning and upskilling to, to a population here in the U.S. that so needs it. And then our middle, middle pillar, Mike, is around workplace equality and trying to get more women into those senior level positions in the industry. And that's been really fun for me to sprinkle some fertilizer on them and grow them and, and get them into that next level role. And then last piece is, is connecting in our communities. And I think we got out of the habit with COVID about being back out in the communities. And so we work with Amazing organizations like Dress for Success, Girls That Code, Moms First, Rethreaded, some of the biggest charities in the country, making a real impact. And so that's where I get to leave my final handprint on the industry it is really making um, an impact in, with the foundation work that we do. So it's great to be here, Mike. Yeah, you, you, Joyce, your whole career has been about connection. I love the way that you're talking about your uh, you're personifying that now literally uh, in, a, in a profound way that affects not only business and communities, but it, it really does affect society. We're not supposed to get a sense of self-worth out of what we do, right? right? Unfortunately, we're human beings. So guess what? We got a sense of self-worth out of what we do. And the fact that your the foundation is working to help to ups, upskill the workforce, yeah. to prepare them so that we can actually develop a workforce to meet not only today's needs, but future needs is a, is a, a huge calling that you have. Uh, and I, I love this, this, this aspect of, um, of, of cherry on top. And the reason yeah. I say that is because that's the name of a book that you wrote that I've had a lot of fun reading. And when, and when I looked at the sort of the message that goes through this, when you talk about the cherry on top, uh, it's the word extra kept jumping into my head. And, but it's not extra with what I do and the results that I drive. It's extra in the relationships of the people that I'm called to interact with. 
And as a leaders, if we can do that and provide extra, that cherry on top with the people that we interact with, um, it's uh, the teams, you know, become uh, just, a, a, this, they scale the productivity and the production that comes out of it. Where did that concept come for you? So um, I was really blessed to be able to write that book in 2019 when I had a little bit of time moving from running the business, which was crazy busy, <laughs> to running the foundation, the, the company allowed me that time to put some of the lessons that I'd learned in the industry and in life in the book. And we launched it in March of 2020. And probably everyone's saying March of 2020, that was a that. horrible time <laughs> to launch a book. Um, but it wasn't, it was so needed right then that little extra positivity, that true cherry on top, that mentality, and so it was a, it's it's a lot of things Mike. One is it's nailing the core and doing just a little more. And you said that with people which is really important, right? Is to do that. But it came from my childhood where my dad um was a farmer mm. and he had three little girls. <laughs> and you all, you know, probably a farmer kind of wants that boy, but he had three wonderful girls, Karen, Christy, and Joyce. And we would travel in the summer because it was too hot to grow tomatoes in Florida in the summer. So June, July, and August, my parents would put three little girls in their car and travel across America, seeing this beautiful country that we live in. And in those days, Mike, children stayed and ate free at Holiday Inns. Holiday Inn was the national chain at that time. But So we'd be staying in these Holiday Inns across America, but every third or fourth night, we would stay somewhere a little extra. It might have been traveling up the East Coast and we'd be having dinner at the Rainbow Room, which was like, whoa, in New York City, that's wow. fun. That's why I got engaged might... to my wife. <laughs> no way. <laughs> See how we intersect all the time? Or it might have been traveling West and we're out at the Broadmoor Hotel and we're ice skating in the summer. And so what I began to see at five, six, seven years old was these were cherry on top. So I kind of liked that when we got to go to those kind of places. And so I just thought in business, why not take that same concept and always think about doing a little bit more, caring a little bit more. When I asked my kids what they saw from per their perspective um, with their mom and business, what, what, what did you see? And they said, you cared more than anyone else, Joyce, mom, you just cared a little bit more. And so I think- Caring a little bit more and making it personal and bespoke to that person, what's important to them is how you really put a cherry on top. Yeah, that's huge. And especially because of the fact that the, one of the, as a matter of fact, the center post of where I spend most of my time has to do with this, this term called soft skills, okay, oh. which is the, the, the human interaction with people. And unfortunately, soft skills um, was a, 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 a a label that was given that I yeah. think isn't really accurate because it, it almost seems like weakness. It almost seems like it's less than, and what your, your, both your book, as well as the way you ran your, your, a deco organization had to do with the personal interaction, the, 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 the human interaction and elevating that to a level that was, was, was critical because of, I, I love this. I wrote this down because businesses, personal right it's personal oh. okay and relationships matter and what happens is especially if anybody works anything that's that's technically ordered we have a tendency and you you point this out when you select people early on in your career you get hard based upon intellect and iq but yep. from that point on as you move throughout your career eq you know trumps that it changes that it, it it's it's a more important factor where did you yeah. see this this thing about relationships uh the really paying dividend when you got yourself and your team to focus on that. So two fun stories there. One is I think your first promotion is a hundred percent your um, IQ. Like you said, the technical ability, that second promotion is 50% IQ and EQ. And then every promotion after that is mostly your EQ. And what's so fun about EQ is you cannot change your IQ. You were born with that, but your EQ is a muscle. You can work, you can develop, you can get better at the at it. It has to be purposeful that you want to get better. You have to take that feedback and learn from that. Um, but I think it's something we can all work on. So you could go straight to the top. 
And that's what we teach in the middle pillar around workplace equality with these women that we're getting up into these really senior level roles in the industry is you can get there. You just have to work that EQ muscle. And the other fun story I wanted to tell you is about how we sold a little bank that I said in Charlotte, North Carolina, that's across the street from me. And that bank today spends over a billion dollars in temporary labor. And the what, one of the ways that we serviced the bank or sold the bank was my idea of let's bring every single business line president into the market. We have a lot of different business lines within a DECO group. And every one of them had a relationship with that bank, whether their mortgage, their credit card, their money. So when those individuals introduced themselves to that bank, they said, and we are a customer and showed that. So, wow, it got to be personal, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't just business. Every single president of every business line either had their money there, their credit card there, their mortgage there. But how creative to make that connection that it got to be personal. Um, and still today, we do business with that amazing bank and they still have all my money too. <laughs> yeah, I love it. But also I, in your book, I was reading this, this cool story early in your career in sales and you're going and you're calling on a company, you're trying to prospect and you walk in the door and there's somebody like gatekeeper right at the front desk. Oh and, yeah. And you walk in and uh, you get the proverbial shutdown, right? The, the, <laughs> sure like did. This, got got the, this thing almost, I can almost visually picture her just uh, and, uh, share, share with our audience, uh, about what, about what you did that you yeah. have to apply EQ too, because what happens here when you get rejected, right? EQ is my definition of EQ is do I react or do I respond effectively? And in that case, your first reaction was leave I'm rejected, but then you responded effectively and share with, share that story. So that was a little tenacity on, on my part is in, in those days, we wanted to make 40 calls and 15 face-to-face -face presentations. So I was doing what's called cue stopping, going out and, you know, trying to get, you know, a, 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 an appointment. And in this particular bank, it was a mortgage company, a very large one. And that what we called the caller or the person that would call the orders out, maybe not the decision maker was at that front desk. And that door dinged when you walked in, ding. And I went in and I made this little pitch to the to that person, Kathy. And she pretty much told me to, thank you so much, you can leave. And so I was like, I was outside the door, Mike, before I knew it. And I'm standing there thinking that didn't go so well. And so I thought, let's retool this. Why don't you not go for the juggler, right? you know, do you use temporary labor? You know, da, da. I went back in, I was new to the city. And I just said, Kathy, I, I, I really like your haircut. Would, would you mind sharing with me, you know, where you get your hair done? It was just, just, just something that I needed to ask. And she said, oh, you're new. And I said, yes. And she said, I said, I need a dentist. I need a doctor. I need a hairdresser. I need whatever. And she said, why don't we have lunch? And so what I did then, Mike, was just to build a relationship with that individual, which ended up being one of our largest customers um, and helped our branch go all the way to President's Club based on that business. But honestly, just really connecting. Mm -hmm. So many times I will connect with someone on LinkedIn and they immediately go for the juggler for me and try to get business or do something. I think, can't you just take a minute and get to know me? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a lesson too just to you know slow down build those relationships and then later i'm i'm sure business conversation will come up yeah. but just slow down a bit and get to know the person yeah what you're talking about here is about number one is being present yes being present to the yes. moment letting that person feel a sense of connection and i noticed that when i met you at executive vision is that I, it, it probably was interacting with me but you don't know this but i was kind of watching you too because you were the moderator and i needed to get to know you <laughs> uh but you have this gift of as you're interacting with people is that you it seems like you kind of just everything else moves to the side and right there at that moment they're the the most important thing i remember sitting on 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 the the, the couch while we we're waiting for the meeting to start and we were talking and uh, I felt like I just met you, but it's like you, you had this desire to know who I was and it was a sense of connection that took place. Um, you, and the second thing around that is that you were real. I mean, here you are, you know, U.S. president of literally the, the largest staff organization globally, and you were in charge of the biggest profit center. Um, 
but I, I, I was talking to Joyce, not the U.S. president. What, yeah. What's the mistake that you've seen leaders make whenever they, they are, they're more of a leader than a person? Two things there, Mike, I, I say, and my father taught me both of them. One is you vote with your time. Mm -hmm. You vote with your time. So what's really important to you? Make sure you're spending time and you're really present. These phones are dangerous material. They tell that person or that child or that customer or whatever that you're not as important as what's coming in right now. Careful with those. I, I really believe in really connecting. Um, the second thing my dad taught me um, was don't let anybody or anything change who you are. Be authentically yourself. And if you can't be, then, then, then maybe that's not where you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So I never really changed who I was. And I was, you know, probably a little, a little bit different, you know, maybe in, in that role than, you know, some of my counterparts. Um, there's a great story here. So Ray Rowe was a general in the United States Army. And Ray was running our LHH business, our Lee Hecht Harrison business. And the ADECO group went through an audit. And so they asked Ray to move from Lee Hecht Harrison to run the ADECO brand in the U.S. When he came over to the ADECO brand, he was looking for a chief operating officer. So there were about five of us interviewing for the job, four men and me. I knew I was probably a long shot. <laughs> Ray had been a general in the United States Army. I really had never been in the military, respected it, but didn't know a lot about it. And so I was scared and kind of thinking I was, you know, not going to get that role. To my surprise, Ray selected me as the chief operating officer of the organization. So I was going to run the ops and he was going to run um, the business. We had a magical relationship. He taught me so much. He taught me about battalion commanders and how they would win wars and not generals. And what that meant in our business was there were regional vice presidents who were running 10 branches or more. They would be the ones to tell the field to take the hill or what we needed to do. And so I just learned so much from Ray. But one year, we were finishing out the year. We'd had a phenomenal year. We're all making target. We're all making our bonus. Life is going really, really well. And we were going to have a really big write-off. And it was going to make us not meet our target and our budget. And it was for a national account that we had taken a risk on servicing. And so Ray said, we're not going to make our bonus. We're not going to make our target. Right here at the end, we're going to have this really bad write-off. And he said, everybody will be affected. And I said, no, 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 not everybody. Remember, Ray, it's just me, you, and Stephen, because we took the risk of servicing the account. We told the field that we were taking the risk. And he said, sometimes he called me Russell when he, uh, and he said, Russell, do you not understand? We don't have the gross margin dollars. They're not paying the bill. How would we pay the bonus? I said, no way. I understand that. But we're talking about culture here. We're talking about our word as leaders. We told the field that that wouldn't happen. And so he looks over at Stephen Nolan and he said, I want to know right now, is she right or am I right? And of course, Stephen Nolan, our CFO, knew we weren't going to have the money to come in. So he said, Ray, I you know, agree with you. We're going to have to not be able to pay these bonuses. He picked up his phone, Mike, and he called uh, PETA, his assistant, and he said, PETA, I need marketing and communications in my office right now. And he looked over at me and he said, you protected our culture. You stay, stood for the word that, that I should have stood for. And he said, you're being promoted to president of the company tomorrow morning. You will run the company, Joyce. Mm. And that's how I went from COO to president. And that in that moment, my dad's rang true to me saying, don't let anything or anyone change who you are. I, I, I didn't in that moment. I stood for what I believed in is to stand true to our word. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, that that's a great story in a yeah. really, there, there, in a, a, in a moment. <laughs> yeah, there, but there's a huge message in there, Joyce, for the fact that it's not, yes, you, you, you had integrity, all right? And to me, integrity isn't something we brag about, right? It's the, yeah. it's the price of admission to get in the door. It really is. But what I heard you say is that as, as what you did is you focused on results, you know, that's yeah. important. But the way you focused on results is by focusing on the people. Mm -hmm. They were going to be affected. The, which is the role of the leader. It's like one of my, my, my favorite quotes. It should be my quote. And I keep, I have some quotes out there, but it's, uh, <laughs> it actually comes from a guy named Tom Winninger that uh, 
uh, it, 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 I still remember, remember interviewing him. He talked about the, the, it's the energy of your, the future of your company is based upon the energy of your people. You know, love the that of your company is based upon the energy of your people. So your job as a leader is to release that energy. And that's, that, that's, that's your role. Because what happens is if you're going to scale, you can no longer do this, just you. And I, I love the fact that you have this huge, big, massive, you know, fortune, you know, 500, you know, company experience, but everything you're talking about pertains to the boutique staffing firm, the boutique real estate company. Oh, yeah. It has to do with the fact of if you're going to scale, you have to increase the productivity that comes out of the people who choose to follow you. And so from an integrity standpoint, but it also has to do with, are you putting the right people around yourself that you need to be devoting your time and energy? It's the selection of the right talent. Jim Collins, they call, you know, getting the right people on the bus. Uh, and yeah. you believe... And I, and uh, which is you know, the way I, you know, the, I built my business also, it has to do with it's, you have to look at, at, at the talent that you surround yourself with and you can't be bringing in people who have not a mediocre talent, but a mediocre mindset. Right. And then talking about things. And there's actually a formula that you and I were talking about that talked <laughs> about is, is you're hiring. Show that, show that formula. Yeah. With yeah. I went, I went to Baylor university in Texas. I, I know you sit in Houston and uh, there was a chain store that started in Texas uh, called Neiman Marcus. And it, it you know, you got always wanted something at Neiman Marcus. It's really a, a wonderful store. And so I used to say that I shop for talent at Neiman Marcus, and I don't mean in the store, but I mean those kind of products, really exceptional individuals. Um, and then I wanted them on our team, our team. Then I believed in um, giving them great training and development. That That's a raise when people care about you and get you developed and spend money on. And I feel like I've been so blessed at Echo to have that. And then I believe in empowerment allowing them to do the job and not micromanage. No one wants to be micromanaged, but also believe in paying them fairly, um, bonusing them well. And then the last thing, Mike, is I believe that we should have a ton of fun. I, I love the work that we do. I feel so lucky that to get in an industry where you're finding great people, great jobs and careers and great companies, great talent. I mean, it's so easy, right? It's just passion just ignites in that, in that area. So I, I had 170 senior managers in the field when we were running a deco staffing and the average tenure with our company was 17 years. The average was 17 years. And in our business, there can be a lot of turnover, but I believe that people quit people and not companies. So we were very selective in, in the people that joined and you had to earn the right to that seat, to stay in that seat in that branch in that particular market. Cause you're the president when you're running that market in that branch. So we were pretty picky about it, but um, we just had an amazing run with amazing talent and, and uh, people in the field. And I love every bit of it. Yeah, and I love this whole concept of development. We've talked before about the difference between training and development trainings. I teach you to do development is I teach you to think. Yes. And because of that is that you would select people that, and ask a lot of them, but you would give them an opportunity to be able to um, to stretch and expand and grow and put resources into them. Um, and, and in order to do that, you'd have to turn them loose, right? Yeah, yeah you really so, you really did. So how do you um, take how do you take these high performance people and that have to have objectives and direction, uh, but at the same time, not micromanage? Because we know in today's time, that's the evil word that people keep saying, I hate being micromanaged. We know that that's one of the greatest causes of turnover when somebody feels like they're being micromanaged. Yeah, I think you have to give them a framework, you know, but but Maine is different than Montana that, you know, there's diff the, the country is very diverse and, and different. So Miami is not run the same as New Orleans, as in, you know, Maine. So you've got to let, get, let that person work in their market and make it their own in, in that market and empower them to do that work, but give them the structure to be successful. And I, I think accountability is sometimes looked at as bad. I think it's so wonderful to hold people accountable. Um, we're getting ready to have our team meeting where we meet um, in the foundation at mid-year to see where we are on the journey of our goals this year. And the purpose of that team meeting is for everyone to see where everybody is and can anybody help anybody else 
who might be behind in, in maybe a goal? Are we making it up military placements right now? You know, if you talk about, you know, upskilling and reskilling, where are we with that? You know, could we, you know, move some more people over from dress for success? So we, we get together. So day one is all about that, Mike. And day two is all about connecting, you know, being in Charleston together, connecting, seeing that city, going on a little city tour together, maybe having a little team building activity, breaking bread and having a great lunch together. So, um, and I think touching base and checking in and making sure um, tells that person you care. I want them to max on their bonus. So mm -hmm. how are we doing on that max on the bonus journey? Can Who's not going to, and how can we get you there? Yeah, I hear two words coming out. I hear care, you know, it, uh, it's, yes. it's my action, not my words that show how much somebody feels like I care about them. Yes. Uh, but the second word that comes in here, that's an underlying factor is trust. Is does the person you're interacting with, do they feel like you're approaching them from a place of, of, of trust that they are capable? Uh, and uh, it, there's, a, <clears throat> there's a story that is so important for us to talk about and that's work-life balance because it's based uh -huh. upon the word trust. I mean, when I, when I thought about this after you shared that with me, in today's time, people want work-life balance. And what happens is there's this real false picture that work-life balance is, see my, my camera hands here, you know, it's, it's like this, right? Where this isn't work-life balance, is it? Work-life mm -hmm. balance is, it's movement. Yeah, it's like Sometimes that seesaw. Career, yeah, it's seesaw type of thing. You have to live that out in a profound way whenever, I don't know if it was the largest, but one of the largest clients oh, yeah. that you were responsible for had a major problem to wrestle the ground and you had to make a strategic decision. Why don't you share what that was about? Yeah, I, I get this question a lot around work-life balance. And I, I always want to be honest with everyone that when you choose to run a $2.3 billion business with a thousand branches in the U.S., you're choosing that role. So you just need to know that there's a big responsibility of travel and, you know, in that role of running that p &L. So the first thing I always say is make sure you want that and that you've got the home life, you know, that you can handle all, all, all just one life. I always say it's not work life, it's one life, right? And so with David and Bryson and Coleman, it was just my life. They were the most important things in my life. And so um, I did have a big choice. When my son Coleman was a senior in high school, he was a high school All-American lacrosse player. He was going to go play college ball. He's at Providence Day. He had seven home games. And he came to David and I, and he said, Mom and Dad, you one of you have always been at one of my games and loved seeing you in the stands. But for this senior year, for my seven home games, I'd love you both there. And so I said, okay, I, I, we can do that. You know, dad's with GlaxoSmithKline. He's selling drugs. Mom's selling people. Those are the Russells you wanted at a party, right? No. So anyway, we're going to both be at those home games. Well, on a Thursday at 430 means that I've got to land by 230 to get to that field to be on time because planes aren't always on time. So I'm told Ansley and Sarah, help me make that happen. Make, make sure that I can get back. I'm doing so good, Mike. I'm like at game four. I'm right there on the field with David, watching him, not looking at my Blackberry, not doing anything, but focused on Coleman on the field. Well, a tsunami happened in Asia that year. And when that tsunami happened, we could not get parts to one of the biggest customers that, that ADECO has in Marysville, Ohio. And we have about 3,000 temporary associates that are on that line making those cars in Marysville. So now the parts are not going to be able to get to the plant. And we've got a problem with 3,000 people not having work to do. So the president of that organization said he was going to fly from Japan to be in Marysville on that Thursday and wanted me to be in the plant. Now, Mike, that was when I told Coleman I would be at one of those games so what do I do? That was ADECO's largest account. Do I go to the account and be present and be there? Or do I, you know, my word to Coleman that I'd be on the field. So I used a methodology that I learned from Susie Welch. She wrote a book about it called 10, 10, 10. How will this affect me in 10 minutes? How will this affect me in 10 months? And how will this affect me in 10 years? In 10 minutes, when I would have told Coleman that I couldn't be at the game, I had to go to Marysville to make this really big decision on behalf of the company, he would have said something like, that's okay, mom, you've always chosen a deco. 
Ooh, painful. And in 10 months, I believe that Coleman would have tried, tried a beverage he shouldn't have tried or driven a car at a speed he shouldn't have been driving at because I didn't do what I said I was going to do. So he didn't do what he said he was going to do. And then I felt like in 10 years, I'd be standing at his rehearsal dinner and he and his future wife would be looking back at David and I and said, yep, now we're going to choose when we see you. Thanks for joining us today on Lighting the Path, Strategies for Tomorrow's Leaders. If anything in this podcast speaks to you, if I've challenged you, or if you want to spend time digging into this subject a little deeper, or if you disagree with me, reach out. My contact information is on our website, lightingthepath.net, or email me at mike at mikelejeune.com. Also, look for me on LinkedIn. I'd love to connect our networks. Keep lighting the path for those who choose to follow you. It's more than a responsibility. It's an honor.